some lectures that I'm do, doing uh, for a uh, laboratory uh, experience, or actually, uh, rather, uh, a laboratory experience for respiratory students. So I'm going to go ahead and pick up where we left off, talking about types of positive pressure ventilators. There are really three major types, and really only two of them are commonly encountered. Uh, but the, the three types, the first type is something known as electrically powered, and it is literally that. There's, there's a, an electrical compressor or electrical motor that compresses air in the atmosphere and then blows that, basically, um, blows that air into the patient. Um, these are, these are uh, much older, um, not as common, but we, you still see them in some of the home settings. Um, one of the ventilators that I've run across um, that is purely electrically powered is something known as the LP6 home ventilator. So they're still out there, they're just not as common. Uh, the, the next type of ventilator is, is something known as a pneumatically powered ventilator, and that is a ventilator that's literally powered off of nothing but gas, but compressed gas, be it air or oxygen. Um, and I would dare say that most of you at this point have come across a pneumatically powered ventilator, and you may have not even known it. And this is... Um, of course, uh, the IPPB, or Intermittent Positive Pressure Breathing Machine. The IPPB machine, like say the, the, what I call the Green Meanie, or the, 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 the Bird Mark 7, is um, almost a prototype of a pneumatically powered ventilator. It literally is. And you could actually, um, if you guys have interfaced with this, and hopefully you have at this point, and generally we like to teach IPPB first in the second semester of respiratory school, um, before going to mechanical ventilation during the summer because a lot of the same concepts with IPBB carry over to mechanical ventilation because IPBB is nothing but um, a pneumatically powered ventilator. So when you talk th about things like um, setting your maximum pressure, your flow, um, some of the entrainment devices, the sensitivity, and so on, these are analogous to what we do in mechanical ventilation. Um, some of the more common uh, pneumatically powered ventilators that we run across in the um, clinical setting, aside from IPPB machines, are mainly going to be what we call transport ventilators, and these are ventilators that perhaps certain um, transport teams will use, or maybe you need to take a patient from the ICU or ER to maybe have um, an MRI or a CT or, or some sort of nuclear medicine um, or, or, or some sort of... Um, um, angiography or some sort of radiographic intervention. Um, often it's not as feasible to take the, the large ventilator and we'll take a transport ventilator and um, generally things like Autovent 2000s, um, Parapax, uh, types of ventilators like that are purely pneumatically driven and this is actually handy because I don't have to worry about um, ox I don't have to worry about um, electrical source um, you know, so I don't have to worry about power. A lot of these uh, pneumatically powered ventilators can be made with non-ferromagnetic material, so they're MRI friendly, which is definitely a plus. Um, however, they depend on pressure, a pressurized gas source. So if you end up running out of a gas, your ventilator no longer works, and clearly that can be an issue. Um, I've used uh, several of these on some of the transports that I've done. Um, mainly overseas in Afghanistan we used um, uh, uh, oxy logs, Draeger oxy logs um, and they were pretty much pneumatically powered um, so that's the that that's pneumatically powered the, the next type which is probably the most common type and the type that we interface with most often and these are the combined electric and pneumatic microprocessor um, ventilators and these ventilators of course uh, make use of um, computer computer systems, algorithms, um, computerized algorithms. Um, not only do they, they hook up to a, a compressed gas source, um, but you also hook them up to electrical source. Um, some of these may have their own batteries. Some of these may be able to run off of room air. Um, there's a real wide variety of these combined um, electric and pneumatic microprocessors. But the microprocessing ability is, is really nice on these ventilators because it allows us to do a lot of different things that we don't necessarily, or we're not necessarily able to do on, say, an electrically powered or pneumatically powered um, ventilator only. Okay, so we talked about the basic types of ventilators. Um, let's go ahead and real quickly talk about why would I need to put somebody on a ventilator. Now, what are the indications for mechanical ventilation? Well, the indications are pretty broad, and there's a lot of gray area, a lot of interpretation, and a lot of clinical judgment. 
Um, this is a very difficult area to talk about. Uh, but generally speaking, acute respiratory failure or impending respiratory failure um, are your two big uh, indications. We'll talk about those in a little more depth. Uh, certain special therapeutic interventions, say somebody needs to go to surgery, go to the um, operating theater, um, they, you may need to mechanically ventilate them because we give them medications, anesthetics, that, that will basically depress um, breathing and airway reflexes. Uh, perhaps prolonged apnea. Uh, somebody who's some sort of drug overdose, some sort of neurological, uh, devastating neurological issue uh, to where they are completely apneic, they can't breathe. So those are the major um, indications for mechanical ventilation. Let's just go ahead and talk about them in a little more detail. Let's talk about a respiratory failure or acute respiratory failure. And this is on, uh, some sort of uncompensated issue. Uh, we all know that there are a lot of COPD patients out there that may have elevated CO2 um, but they are compensating very well. You know, their metabolic system is compensated. Even though their CO2 is elevated, their pHs are re relatively normal, and they, they live a relatively um, active uh, lifestyle. Um, that's not the kind of patient I'm talking about. I'm talking about somebody who is acutely decompensated in respiratory failure. Um, of course, there are two types of respiratory failure. There's type 1, and that's what's known as a hypoxemic respiratory failure, and this is failure to oxygenate. This is oxygen levels are low. Um, be it uh, SpO2, PaO2, 8 a gradient, things of that nature uh, to assess for type 1 respiratory failure. Type 2 is known as hypercapnic respiratory failure, and this is the, the typical respiratory failure that, that we're familiar with where the, the carbon dioxide becomes elevated, and they're not able to effectively ventilate or blow off gases. And, of course, you can often get a combined respiratory failure, type 1 and type 2, where you have both an oxygenation and a ventilation issue. Uh, impending respiratory failure, this is another kind of a gray, gray area. You know, what is impending? Um, how bad is somebody? And um, how conservative do I want to be? Again, a lot of gray area here. No hard, fast rules. You guys are gonna you're gonna kind of learn this in the clinical environment mo much better than I, that I could ever describe in in a 10 minute video. But basically, what this is is re if respiratory failure is imminent, we've done some conservative interventions, and those interventions have failed. Our patient continues to deteriorate. They're they're either maintaining or barely maintaining some sort of homeostasis. Um, maybe their gas is, their blood gas doesn't look good. But their work, they have significantly increased work of breathing. They're becoming tired. They're becoming lethargic. Their breathing is becoming irregular. And they are generally circling the drain, as I like to say. Um, generally, um, when, we, when we intervene with patients, let's say you know, somebody has congestive heart failure, and uh, you know, we give them an ACE inhibitor, we put them on CPAP, um, you know, look at their labs and, you know, check their serum osmolality and perhaps consider uh, diuresing them, give them nitroglycerin, all of this, and, and they don't generally improve and they continue to deteriorate, you know, that would be a, a kind of patient, um, this impending ventilatory respiratory failure that we consider intubating. Okay. Um, assessment of impending respiratory failure, lots of things we can assess here. Something called the MIP or the Maximum Inspiratory Pressure or NIF. Uh, negative inspiratory force both mean the same thing, and that's just how much pressure somebody can suck in with. Generally, negative 50 to negative 100 uh, centimeters of water is normal, and you want at least negative 20. If it's less than that, negative 18, 17, 15, they're probably going to buy a tube. Um, their vital capacity needs to be at least 15 milliliters per kilogram or at least a liter. Tidal volume at least 5 mils per kilogram. A respiratory rate um, of less than 35. Their pH needs to be higher than 7.25. Um, if it's less than that, we need, you need to look at intubating them. Their CO2 is, needs to be less than 55, um, or um, maybe it's decreasing. It was at 55, but now it is decreasing. Uh, PF ratio, that's the ratio of uh, PaO2 to FiO2. Um, you want it, uh, really you want it greater than 300. Normal is 475. So if it's less than 200, um, you have a serious problem. And the PaO2, it needs to be greater than 70. If it's less than 70, and we've done pretty aggressive interventions to get that up, you need to look at intubating um, and mechanical ventilation. So those are just some of the general um, numbers that we look at, and they love to throw those numbers out in exams. 
Okay, guys, um, I'll go ahead and call it quits for now, and we'll pick it up later. Take care.